I'm going to give you the big picture of video capture so you can understand the landscape. And then we'll drill down into some of the key details that you actually need. If you spend a little time here with me, you'll probably save yourself hours of frustration later on when you're reading forum posts or trying to figure out what gear to buy. Now, before we dive in, let's just talk about why. Magnetic tapes were never designed to last forever. Even if they've just been sitting on a shelf, they're breaking down a little bit every single day. The colors fade, there can even be mold, and the material that's actually holding the magnetic signal literally deteriorates. So time's not on your side, and that's why it's important to do it once, to do it right. Okay, now let's look at the single most important fork in the road, figuring out what kind of tape you actually have, because that one fact will determine everything else that follows. I'm going to put these into two categories. You've got analog tapes like VHS, VHS-C, Video 8, Hi-8, and those store video as a wavy magnetic signal. And to digitize those, we need to play them back and capture that signal in real time. Digital tapes, on the other hand, like Mini DV and Digital 8, are completely different. Yes, they're on a tape, but they already store the data as ones and zeros. So with those, we don't actually capture them. That's not even the right word. We just transfer the same way as you'd copy a file from one hard drive to another. So these are two very different paths. Okay, let's start with the easy one, digital tapes. If your tapes are Mini DV or Digital 8, you're in luck. Your job is a whole lot easier. The key is to keep the signal digital from beginning to end. So that means no yellow RCA cables, no cheap USB dongles. Instead, you want to connect your camcorder directly to your computer using a Firewire cable. Think of Firewire as the cousin of USB 2. It came out at around the same time, and back in the early 2000s, camcorders and even some external hard drives relied on Firewire. But over time, manufacturers stopped putting Firewire ports on cameras and computers, and USB took over everything. Which means that your current computer, with its rows and rows of USB ports, almost certainly does not have Firewire port at all. Now, ideally, you'd use the same camcorder that originally recorded that digital footage, but if you don't have it anymore, most mini DV or digital 8 camcorders with a Firewire port will work. Myself, I use the Sony TRV-17 for my mini DV. Now the next part is really important because Firewire isn't as simple on modern computers as it used to be. Most new motherboards don't have a Firewire port at all, so you'll need to add a Firewire PCIe card. If you've never installed any kind of peripheral inside your computer on the motherboard, it's actually easier than you would think. And not all Firewire cards are equal. The ones with the Texas Instruments or TI chipset are considered to be the gold standard. They tend to be the most reliable for video transfer, whereas the cards that are based on the VIA chipset, they often fail or cause drop frames, so avoid those. But even with a good Texas Instruments card, Windows 10 and 11 can be finicky. Firewire support is still there, but sometimes your camcorder just won't show up. The workaround is to install the legacy IEEE 1394OHCI driver from Microsoft. And once you do that, in most cases, your camera connects perfectly. Now, once you're connected, the software is really simple. There are two main ones called WinDV and Scenalyzer Live. They're both free and they're lightweight and they allow you to transfer those videos onto your computer in the DV AVI format. Those files are bit for bit identical to what's on the tape. There's no recompression, there's no loss. It's just literally a clean copy of what is on the tape. Okay, so far we've covered digital tapes, which are straightforward. But now let's talk about the other side of that fork in the road. Analog formats like VHS, VHS-C, Video 8, and Hi-8. This is the more involved path, but it's also the one where the decisions you make can really affect quality. Here's the first golden rule of analog capture. Your final digital file can never be better than the signal coming out of your playback deck. That deck, that VCR, that camcorder, whatever, it's the single most important piece of gear. And here's the second golden rule. You want to avoid all the artifacts that bad equipment introduce. So for example, artifacts are those ugly little side effects that distract from the actual footage. For example, you might see dot crawl or tiny dots or checkerboard patterns crawl along the edges of objects or rainbow streaks. You can also get color bleeding. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but all this to say is that a high-end VCR with a built-in line TPC and digital noise reduction helps prevent or minimize many, many of these issues. Now, the reason why people give such conflicting advice online 
is because there are a lot of different workflows out there. Here's a quick overview of the most common ones that you'll hear about. There's the SD capture workflow, which involves an ATI all in wonder or an ATI 600, or maybe the IO data or the Hopage. These are considered the classics for clean, lossless, standard definition captures. If you read the forums, you'll find that although the experts sometimes have some minor disagreements, they mostly all use one of these devices as their capture device. There's also the DV25 workflow, which involves using a mini DV camcorder or a digital aid camcorder to digitize your tapes. Now, this doesn't mean that you're playing your VHS tape inside the mini DV or the digital aid camcorder. That's just not possible. Instead, you're using the circuitry inside that camcorder or something like the Canopus DV box as a kind of a bridge. The VHS deck sends its analog signal into the camcorder and that camcorder circuitry converts that signal into DV, which you then transfer over Firewire. I find this workflow, frankly, one of the easiest to use. The files tend to be smaller. And while DV does compress color, in practice, I think it's a pretty solid contender. When you factor in the ease of use and the fact that it gives you pretty good quality, it has a lot going for it. There are also HDMI capture devices, and a lot of these are kind of cheap, and they weren't really designed to digitize analog tapes. But if you do go this route, the RetroTank is probably the most famous one and the best one. It handles analog signals and converts them properly, and the product is still under development, and it seems to be getting better every year. A close cousin of that HDMI capture is the SDI capture. So for this, you would use what's considered a professional converter, something like the Bright Eye or the Black Magic. It captures in 10-bit. It's high quality. There are a couple of users on the forums who are experts who really do believe in it, but it can be a little bit more complex and a little bit more expensive. Next up are DVD recorders. Now, these have been around for a long time, and these are standalone decks that will burn the video straight to a DVD. Now, the nice thing here is the convenience, because after you're done, you can pop that finished disc into any DVD player or even a Blu-ray player, and you can watch it right away. The trade-off is that it uses MPEG-2 and a relatively low bit rate, so there's some compression, and there will be some artifacts, especially some blocks. And if you want to share your video on YouTube or edit it on your computer, you'll need to add an extra step of ripping that DVD back to a computer computer file and then converting it. The more modern version of those DVD recorders is what I'll call these all-in-one recorders, devices like the Cloner Alliance ViewLight AV. It saves the file directly onto a USB stick or an SD card. It's super easy to use, but one of its features is also one of its drawbacks. The device will deinterlace the video on the fly, which certainly makes it easier for most users, but the on-the-fly deinterlacer is not nearly as good as the software-based deinterlacer. So once you have captured with this device and once it has deinterlaced the video on the fly, there's no going back. I've done a test of the Cloner Alliance ViewLight AV on this channel, and although the quality isn't as good, and although I'm not a fan of the way it deinterlaces, it did handle one of my most uh, wavy tapes very well. Anyway, we'll talk more about those trade offs at the end of the video. The last workflow I wanted to mention is the RAW RF capture. Now, this is a brand new method where you capture the, what they call the radio frequency signal straight off the tape and you decode it later in software. So instead of using the usual RCA ports or uh, as video ports on the back of the VCR, you actually tap into what's called a test point inside the VCR. Now, some VCRs and camcorders are preferred for this method because the test points are easier to access. If those all-in-one recorders I just mentioned are at one end of the spectrum for simplicity and convenience, then the RF capture is at the extreme other end. It bypasses all of the VCR's built-in video circuitry. It ignores any stabilizers or line TBCs or filters in any of the other devices. It's just the raw signal that goes directly into your computer, untouched. And the promise here is that the software decoding can eventually replicate or even surpass what today's best and most expensive hardware TVCs and processors do in real time. 
Now, this method is pretty technical, and I would not recommend it for beginners. But as of October 2025, the people behind the project are working on a new version, a new hardware, which will combine a lot of what's already been done and hopefully make it a little bit easier for people to get into this. And I have to also think that when all those frame time-based correctors and high-end VCRs eventually wear out, all we will be left with are those basic VCRs. And this approach, this RF capture approach, could be the only reliable way to get the best possible quality from old tapes in the future. So as you can see, there's a wide spectrum of workflows. Some methods are simple and beginner friendly, while others aim for the absolute best quality and require the most gear or technical know-how. And I won't rule any of them out. Depending on your comfort level with computers and how much time you want to invest, how much money you want to invest, I think any of these methods could be the right choice for you. Because regardless of what anybody says, I'd rather see you digitize your tapes with a DVD recorder or one of those all-in-one devices than to never digitize them at all because you couldn't quite figure out what to get or you couldn't find the recommended gear. Now that said, if you want to aim for the best quality, then you need to think of this process as a chain with three essential links. There's the playback device, there's the, call it the stabilizer, and then there's the capture device. All right, let's start with playback. The best choice is one of these high-end SVHS decks with a built-in line TBC. So these are models like the JVC S7600 or the Panasonic AG1980. If you can't find these or you're on a budget, then a good condition JVC or Panasonic VCR with S-Video output can still do very well. Now, the reason why those SVHS VCRs are preferred is because they all come with an S-Video port instead of just composite. And S-Video is better because it keeps the brightness and color parts of the signal separate in that cable. So what that means is less bleeding, a sharper, cleaner video, compared to those all-in-one yellow composite plugs. For those 8mm formats, it's best to use a high 8 camcorder to play back either video 8 or high 8 tapes, since those machines were designed for that job. That gives you the most reliable playback quality. Now that said, there are some digital 8 camcorders that can also play back the older analog tapes, so if you have one of those models, it can work too. I've done some comparisons on this channel, and in practice, it's better to use a high 8 camcorder than a digital 8 camcorder for this task since the dedicated high 8 model usually produces cleaner more accurate playback because it avoids the analog to digital to analog conversion now the second link is stabilization and here's where we need to touch on a bit of jargon there are actually two different things called tbc or time-based corrector there's a line tbc that fixes the visual wobbliness or waviness within each scan line. You'll find line TBCs in some of those higher end Super VHS decks, or you can get a similar effect by running your signal through a Panasonic ES10 or ES15 in pass-through mode. So that's a line TBC. There's also a frame TBC. And a frame TBC doesn't change how your video looks at all. All it does is it buffers the entire frame and it, what they call, reclocks the signal before sending it out to your capture card. This helps prevent dropped frames. That's all it does. Now these devices are now very expensive and very hard to find. One of the more famous ones is the Data Video TBC 1000. Now I've done a video about this, but the good news is that with the right setup with a good VCR that has a line TBC or the ES15 trick, if you got that, then drop frames are already pretty rare and even if one happens occasionally in a long capture, most people will probably never notice. So in other words, while a frame TBC is nice to have, it's not essential for most home projects today, but a line TBC is. The third link is your capture device, and this is where people often make the biggest mistakes. Those cheap no-name USB sticks, avoid them. They drop frames, they crush colors, and they don't look good. Those DV digitizers I mentioned before, like the Cannabis ADVC 100 or the Mini DV camcorders, they are a decent entry point. But the problem is that it compresses to DV, which throws away some of the color detail. So that's why better options are capture devices that record to lossless formats. Things like the ATI 600 or the Hopage USB Live 2 or the IODATA GV USB 2. And then there are those other gears like the Bright Eye, which converts to SDI and can capture a 10-bit quality. 
Now, if you're going with those ATI options, then on the software side, the classic choice is Virtual Dub 1.9.11 with its lossless codec like Hafwa UV or UT Video. On Windows 10, you can also use Amarec TV, which is another solid option and is recommended by many of the experts in the forums. But keep in mind that you will get some big files, about 30 gigabytes per hour. But that is the price of archival quality. All right, I want to talk a bit more about artifacts. Now, that's the term we use to describe problems with a digitized video. I already mentioned waviness, and that's one of the most noticeable problems. But if you have a VCR with a Line TBC or one of those Panasonic ES15 devices in pass-through mode, you won't have that waviness problem. But if you're using a regular VCR, then those troublesome tapes are going to look wavy. The DV25 method can handle the waviness perfectly. So why doesn't it get more love in the forms? Well, because it has the drawbacks of blockiness, another artifact. So what this means in practice is that a regular VCR and the DV25 digitizer is better than a regular VCR and the IO data, for example. But if you have a VCR with a line TBC and the DV25, that combination won't be as good as one of those special VCRs with the IO data. Another artifact to mention is the audio and the video being out of sync. That's also very noticeable. In previous tests, I found that the DV25 method was the most reliable in keeping the audio and the video in sync from start to finish. But I recently digitized a VHS tape using that method, and the video got progressively out of sync. And there are other artifacts like vertical jitter and chroma bleed and dot crawl and ghosting, and I'm boring myself even talking about these. And they're not as noticeable, and sometimes they're fixable in post with software. So bottom line, what should you buy? If you buy one of those good USB capture devices and you output to a lossless video format, that's probably the best. But you'll need a good VCR with a line TBC, or at the very least, the Panasonic ES10 or ES15 in that workflow. And you'll have to learn the settings for virtual dub software or Amarec TV, so you got to consider that as well. The DV25 method, I think, is also good for some people but you'll need to get an older computer that can accommodate a FireWire card, or you've got to get some uh, cables to sort of connect to your modern computer. But once it's working, then you have truly one of the easiest ways to digitize. The software WinDV is much easier to use than the uh, virtual dub software. There's less buttons to press, less settings to set. And yes, the DV25 videos that are uh, digitized, they are compressed, they're not lossless, but you have a built-in TBC, and it's just easier. The RF capture method with the uh, video decode project, I think it's going to become a lot easier to set up in 2026 as this new version of the hardware is set to go on sale. Now, yes, there's more setup at the beginning, and you need to use your computer later on to process the files, so it takes longer, uses more hard drive space, but it will save you from having to buy an expensive VCR with a line TBC. And then there's the Cloner Reliance, one of these all-in-one devices that is super easy to use. So that's it. If you have any questions, please leave a comment and I'll do my best to respond.